Lisa. Yes, baby girl. When I grow up, I want to be a woman to society. And so shall you be. Hey, this is Lisa Landry. Welcome back to A Menace to Society. I am so pleased to bring you today's guest, a very powerful, engaging speaker. He is an author. He does workshops and training throughout America. He is an expert witness who serves as a consultant in domestic violence cases throughout America. Please welcome to the podcast, Barry Goldstein. Hi, Lisa. Thank you so much for speaking with me today. How in the world did you become this leading advocate for domestic violence victims? Well, you, you know, I think um, men who do what ought to be normal get you know, unreasonable praise for doing what's normal because it's not normal to do what's right. Why is it so hard for us just to do what's right? Um, I think because we're not used to it, and I think also that you know you live in a society where men have had unearned privileges forever, and so we kind of expect it. Just to be more specific about your original question, I had a case when I was an attorney where my client had hit his daughter, and I didn't know whether what he did would be considered abusive. And I figured if I don't know with a legal background, how would other parents know? And about that time, a friend of mine asked me to serve on the board of my sister's place, which is a battered women's shelter in Westchester County, New York. And I figured that if I did that, I would learn the answer to that and other questions. And essentially, by getting on the board, I became one of the few attorneys that had a background in domestic violence that came to understand the subject. And so, ever more of my work involved domestic violence. How bad is the domestic violence problem? It is horrific. In the United States, we spend over a trillion dollars every year to allow men to abuse women that they're partnered with. Wait, 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 wait. Um, You're telling me we actually spend money so that men can abuse? Yes. I mean, it isn't like you go and you write out a check, here's the money to abuse women. (laughs) But the cost to the United States and additional health care that's needed in crime, in the harm it does to our economy, et cetera, is over a trillion dollars. Well, that would seem kind of counterintuitive, wouldn't it? Why would we spend money to increase our stress levels and crises? Well, we've been doing it for thousands of years. We've tolerated men's abuse of women, so we're used to it. And it's only in the last couple of years that we have come to understand the financial cost and of course the human cost is much worse and much more important but one of the reasons I talk about the financial cost is that in our society I think public officials would be more likely to make changes because of the financial cost than because of the human cost. Oh heck yeah, oh heck yeah. I don't want to seem cynical, but it doesn't seem like a lot of agencies or organizations actually care about the outcomes of what they're doing on a personal level, but they do care about making money. Right. And and I think a lot of this people are oblivious to. Men can abuse without realizing that they're being abusive. Public officials can make bad decisions that hurt people without realizing or intending to do it. And it's one of the reasons why it's important to talk openly about these topics. Well, you say we're supposed to talk openly about these topics, which makes complete sense to me, because if you don't recognize the problem, you can't fix it. But it doesn't seem like a lot of these domestic violence situations are actually being covered in mainstream media at any level of getting things done. Well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, obviously, 
you have far more coverage of domestic violence today than you did a few decades ago. But, you know, most of my work has to do with child custody and what seemed like forever we were having a problem of getting media coverage. And I don't want to say that we're getting enough coverage, but in the last year or two, we have started to get much more media coverage than we had previously. And I think one of the reasons for that is that we now have very substantial research that confirms what protective mothers have been saying, that the courts are biased in favor of abusers, that the courts are using outdated practices that err on the side of hurting children. And armed with that research, the media is more willing to investigate and to do stories about this scandal. I'm hearing from different moms that I've spoken with and different court reformers that I've interviewed that certain counties or certain towns are worse for protecting children in custody cases than others. Well, I'm sure that's true. I mean, there's there's no location that is good. There are some that are even worse than others. Are there any situations you've been involved in where you just can't believe the outcome or the verdict where the abuser got to walk away with the kids? Always and forever. I mean, that's the whole point. There are so many of those cases. Um, It's really incredible. I, I was in Costa Rica recently because of a New York case, and you had an experienced evaluator who claimed that she was an expert in child sexual abuse. And what happened was, it was this little boy who said that his father was playing the penis game with him, and he started making reports when he was two, and the authorities really didn't pay attention. When he was three, and his mother had to go to court, she left him with his best friend, who was also three, her mother and his mother and this boy took his friend into the bedroom got them both to undress and his penis was sore from trying to push it up his friend's bottom and he urinated over his friend's back and the evaluator you know said well they're just playing doctor you know, and, you know, of course, no genuine sexual abuse expert would dismiss that extreme kind of play of a three-year-old. Three-year-olds don't do things like that. And the mother ran with her child to Costa Rica to try to protect the boy. The New York City courts are all out, you know, trying to punish her and prosecutor and all of that because they made a bad mistake and didn't protect the child. And it was interesting, just a few months later, there was another case in New York where the court demanded that the father have access to the child. The mother gave the access and it was a three-year-old girl was put in a car seat in a car and the car was put on fire killing the girl and the mother's now saying gee i wish i had withheld her and gone to jail rather than that happening and you know it's the kind of impossible decisions that mothers are facing because courts don't know how to recognize domestic violence and child abuse and they don't protect the children You know, that's really sick when you can be threatened with a federal arrest warrant for protecting your child because the people who are entrusted to protect these kids do things like the evaluator you just mentioned. Obviously, she's impaired or paid off or a sociopath. I mean, you know, there's a lot of ignorance. I mean, the, the problem is that, as I said before, we now have very substantial research from highly credible sources like the Center for Disease Control, like the U.S. Justice Department. Courts are not using that. The court professionals are expressing their 
personal subjective opinions, and you're right, they're influenced by the fact that supporting abusers is more lucrative, and they don't know the research that they're making really bad mistakes. How is that possible? I don't understand how that's possible in, in, in our country. You know, obviously, we've got problems in this country. I love America, but we got issues. However, we do have a lot of money here, and we have people who are educated. So how the heck is this happening where somebody has a law degree or is certified or licensed by a state to administer evaluations, and they are overlooking the obvious right in front of them, unless it's not patriarchy or money? Well, certainly that contributes to it. You know, and there is a history here. Remember that in the 1970s, when domestic violence first became a public issue, there was no research. Um, we didn't know necessarily what the causes of domestic violence were. And at that time, the popular assumptions were that domestic violence was caused by mental illness, by substance abuse, by the actions of the victim. So the courts turned to mental health professionals as if they were the experts. And they didn't do that for any bad motives. That, that was popular assumption. The problem is that we now have very substantial research that the original assumptions were wrong, but the courts continue to use the same outdated practices. They hear from the same mental health professionals who are experts in psychology, experts in mental illness, but they're not experts in domestic violence. They're not experts in child sexual abuse. And so they keep getting it wrong. They're not getting the new information. I mean, studies like Ace and Saunders should have been integrated to, in the courts years ago, but it's not. You know, it's interesting. The Bartlow study was a look at cases where the court gave access to a child and the child was murdered by the abusive father, and Dr. Bartlow interviewed judges and, law and court administrators in the communities where these tragedies occurred. And, and I must tell you that these were the, the best judges and court administrators. They had an interest in domestic violence, which is why they participated. And they discussed domestic violence in, in very intelligent, useful terms. But when they were asked the main question, which was, what have you done to reform the court system in response to the murder in your community? The answer was shocking. They said they did nothing because they assumed that the tragedy in their community was an exception. They don't have a method of taking a look at the big picture and seeing, for instance, we now know that in the last 10 years, 650 children were murdered who were involved in contested custody. That's outrageous. A quarter of the children in the United States have been sexually abused. That's the most outrageous statistic I talk about. And it comes from the ACE study, which is the Center for Disease Control, so highly credible. I'm familiar with the ACE study, but I wanted to remind people listening who might not be familiar with that, that is the adverse childhood experiences gauge as to what kind of symptoms a person might experience in their adult life because of what they've been exposed to as a child. Exactly. Fundamentally, what ACE says is children exposed to domestic violence and child abuse are going to live shorter lives and have a lifetime of health and social problems. You can't imagine anything that goes more to the heart of the best interest of the child. And yet most courts are trying to resolve abuse cases without considering the ACE research. It's crazy. I'm sorry, that just strikes me as patriarchy. I just see patriarchy as this entirely maladaptive, malfunctioning cluster of stupidity where we do everything backwards like our great granddads used to do even though we don't think or live in their world um I, and i certainly agree with you and there's certainly widespread gender bias in the courts 
they found out with studies from the 1980s, they never did anything to overcome the gender bias. And a new study by uh, Joan Meyer is about to come out. And one of the findings is that the gender bias is still very strong in the courts. And what the gender bias is doing is not only helping abusive fathers and hurting protective mothers, but most of all, it's hurting children. I don't have any way to know this. It's just my own personal hypothesis. I think some of these school shooters are kids who've been exposed to this kind of abuse. They've been taken away from a parent who cares about them. And no matter how often they call the police to get help or how often they speak out to a teacher trying to get her or him to help or maybe tell other students that they're going to school with that this is happening to them in their homes. They're being abused. They're being sexually exploited. Maybe they're being used for child pornography. And nobody does anything. There's a huge amount of kids experiencing this. Are they the ones that are sometimes taking guns to school? Well, let me put it this way. About a half of the mass shootings are committed by people who have been a history of domestic violence. So there's definitely a connection. And one of the things that was interesting, you know, one of my books is The Quincy Solution, and it's based on the original Quincy model. And I got to interview the district attorney in Quincy during the time that they created the Quincy model, which was a series of best practices that dramatically reduced domestic violence, crime, and especially homicides. And that, his name was Bill Delahunt. And what he did was he noticed that almost every prisoner in a nearby high security jail had a childhood history of domestic violence and often child sexual abuse. And he believed that if he could prevent domestic violence, it would reduce all crime. And so he helped create a, a group of best practices that took domestic violence crime very seriously. And it was very successful because he was right. And it dramatically reduced all crime. And a county that had averaged five or six DV homicides every year enjoyed several years in a row with no murders and then there was one, and then there were back to none. So we know how to prevent domestic violence, crime, and especially murders. We're just not using best practices. How do we get there, Barry? What do we do to, to make that happen? Well, my book, The Quincy Solution, is the answer. We can put together these best practices, and if we do, we will dramatically reduce domestic violence, and then we get to save a big chunk of that $1 trillion that we're spending now to let men abuse women, and we make children healthier, and we reduce cancer and heart disease and mental illness and diabetes. And <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, you know, I'm studying to become uh, a counselor. Childhood trauma is not really new, but there's this a lot of new research going into this issue. And I don't think a lot of people know, like you're saying, you're contributing to a child's future heart disease, diabetes, substance abuse disorders, um, suicidal ideations, and violence. Exactly. You know, when we talk about this research, we often compare it to the 1964 Surgeon General's report linking cancer and smoking. Because what they did, society made fundamental changes to discourage smoking. And in doing that, we've saved millions of lives and trillions of dollars. The, the world is so much better because we know that there's a link between smoking and cancer. And so we try to prevent smoking. Well, the ACE study provides an even greater opportunity because if we can reduce domestic violence and child abuse, the present levels of all these horrible diseases and social problems would be significantly reduced, and we would save even more lives and more money than we did by reducing smoking. 
and yet we're not doing it. <laughs> not very smart, is it? No, it truly isn't. But, you know, there's people like you out there making a difference. And Joan Meyer, and I've spoken with D.V. Leap, Sasha Drubnik over there, and other researchers and lawyers and experts such as yourself. Who are some of the organizations that you speak to? Um, I mean, I actually did four presentations to the American Psychological Association about Ace and Saunders because they, they thought their psychologists should learn about Ace and Saunders. Unfortunately, the courts aren't doing that. I did a couple of roundtable discussions for Office of Violence Against Women and, in one case, the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. Um, I did a training that I really loved for the National Domestic Violence Hotline. And the advocates there, of course, are very knowledgeable about domestic violence. So I, we were talking about how it applied to child custody. So it was a really high-level discussion. And then I must tell you, um, last August I was in Melbourne, Australia. I was invited to be a plenary speaker to talk about health and safety of children in abuse cases um, involving child custody. So, you know, I've had some interesting experiences. Oh, I bet. I bet. I've heard that 58,000 children each year in America are placed with abusers, typically dads. That's more children than are affected by gun violence. So wouldn't you think that we could get on this as a nation? Because obviously our kids are suffering. There's an overlap in these populations of violent perpetrators and kids who've been abused. And it's bleeding over to affect children who are not being abused at home. Maybe yes, this is, and, you know. You know, th think about it. Um, when children go to school, and inevitably there are children in school that are impacted by domestic violence, and those children act out in a variety of ways because they didn't get to sleep the night before, they're scared and traumatized, and we have to take time from educating other children in order to help the children who have been traumatized. So it's, it's impacting us in a lot of different ways. And, you know, one of the problems in the court system is that they are trained to look at each case and each incident separately. And in doing that, they're missing the context. They're not seeing the patterns of their mistakes. And the assumption is that when they make a decision, it must be right. And in most other types of cases, it is. But when we deal with domestic violence and child abuse, they are getting a very high percentage of those cases wrong. And, you know, very frankly, they don't want to know that. No, I don't think they want to know that. I was talking to a social worker who told me that they don't test the same way for child sex abuse that they used to because there were too many false positive results back in the 80s. But I'm of the mindset that maybe some of those results were just too positive and they didn't want to look at the population that's actually being affected because the numbers are so great. You know, one of the big problems, and this was true with the Catholic Church scandal and the Penn State scandal and the Boy Scout scandal and the Olympic scandal, is that there is this myth that women and children frequently make false reports of abuse. And that's totally wrong. You know, children should be believed, delivered false reports of less than 2% of the time. But because of that myth, you have all these professionals who are extremely skeptical, who are looking for reasons not to believe uh, reports of child sexual abuse, or, and domestic violence for that matter, and they discredit these reports based on information that is not probative. And they do it, you know, routinely. You know, you got to work really hard to get a quarter of our children sexually abused. I mean, that's the most outrageous statistic, that we would allow a quarter of our children to be sexually abused. And we do it because our practices and our responses are so wrong. And we're not listening to the right people, and we're not believing children. Do you think that people are going to start believing kids more? Like with this Me Too movement, there's newer people coming into 
therapy. There's newer people coming into the court system. And what I mean is millennials, women, people of color, people have actually trained recently and know the newer modes of therapy and research. Do you think that this will be a paradigm shift in the family court system within the next decade? I, I don't know about the timing. I think the research is really helpful. I think the fact that the media is starting to cover some of the problem is helpful. You know, I, it may be that there will be some kind of spectacular case that sort of forces a, a look at it. I mean, we've had there's all sorts of incredible stories. It may be that there's something, it may be because someone is really well known, it may be that, you know, just thinking about that child is too much to bear. I mean, I don't think they can keep doing this forever, but, you know, they they really should have stopped a long time ago. Well, yeah, too, especially because that number that you're saying, one quarter of all American children being sexually abused, which obviously lifelong repercussions and pain and suffering, those kids grow up. So what do you think would happen if people who have lived through this family court system and been victimized as children and now they're adults, what if they started speaking out? Do you think that would help? Well, I think it would. I mean, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the courageous kids. These are young adults who went through the court system, were sent to live with the abusers, were denied relationships with their mothers, and they've aged out of their custody order, and they spoke out. And, you know, when they speak out, they have a moral authority that the rest of us don't have. Yeah. And, you know, it's really powerful. So, you know, I, I think that can help, but of course, a lot of children who are sexually abused are silenced. I mean, it's one of the worst things about our failure to believe children is that children are sent to live with their abusers and are silenced. But at some point, they're not going to be able to hold this back anymore. Yeah, and there's too many. There's too many people affected, adversely affected. So what is the one thing you would do? Because I know you are an expert. You're an authority. I'm so grateful for your time today. It's BarryGoldstein.net. What is the one thing you would do if you had complete control over every family court system right now in America? What would you do to, to make change happen? I would pass the Safe Child Act, which is the solution. It would require that we make the health and safety of children the first priority sounds obvious, but it's kind of scandalous we're not doing that. It would require courts to integrate current research, use a multidisciplinary approach that includes experts in domestic violence and child sexual abuse. It would require early hearings limited to the issue of abuse in cases involving abuse, obviously. It would require training and retraining of court professionals. They need to be trained with the new research, but they also need to be retrained to stop using and believing so much of the misinformation that they've heard their entire careers. And I would provide funding for DV agencies so that they could help in training court professionals and also that they could be expert witnesses on issues involving domestic violence. And the Safe Child Act, I think, is what would make the court safe for children. And the Child Safe Act, that's passed in a few states now, currently, yeah? Um, we have five states that have introduced it. No states have passed it yet. I think if we could get one or two states to pass it, Everyone will see how great it works, and it would quickly be passed everywhere. And, of course, you know, there's a lot of uh, court professionals who make a lot of money hurting children. And I don't want to say they're trying to hurt children, but that's the outcome, um, who like the status quo 
And I think you have a lot of court prof- officials who want to deny that they're getting so many cases wrong. And so that's really what needs to get overcome. It doesn't seem like such a, a huge task. If you break it down into small steps, it could be accomplished. Um, hopefully. And as we said earlier, when public officials understand how much money we're wasting allowing men to abuse women, you know, we could find much better uses for that money. This is going to sound very cynical, Barry. Please forgive me. I don't think a lot of men want to end the abuse against women because, and I'm not saying men are abusive. Obviously, most men are not. It's only about what? I think 8 or 10% of men abuse women, either through coercive control or domestic violence or sexual well, abuse. That depends on how you define abuse. Most domestic violence is neither physical nor illegal. And so if you consider all forms of coercive and controlling behavior, I think you'd get pretty close to 100% of men. You said that, I didn't. I think a lot of guys, though, a lot of guys feel like they're entitled to act a certain way and to control their woman. I mean, I don't, that sounds so ugly to say, but, you know, a lot of guys do put a bitch in her place. And if you don't keep your woman in her place, you look emasculated to your peers. So you kind of keep up what you're supposed to do, right? I mean, isn't that going on? Or am I just being cynical? No, you know, think about for a second, many of the football players in the NFL who got involved in domestic violence and child abuse. And one of the things that came out is that what they were doing was exactly what they had witnessed and experienced growing up as children, both in terms of domestic violence and child abuse. So a lot of them sincerely thought that they were doing the right thing because that's what they grew up with. And so we need to change that. Domestic violence is different than most other crimes because until a generation ago, this behavior was perfectly legal. There weren't any criminal consequences. Getting across the idea that if you engage in this behavior, there are now consequences is one of the big things we need to do to change this behavior, to to send a message that men no longer have the right to coerce and control their partners. I like I like that as a goal. How would you like me to tell you a story? Many years ago, three young children told their mother that their father was physically and sexually abusing them. And the mother did everything right. She sought protective order, she sought custody, and she made a complaint with Child Protective Agency. And initially the children were protected. And the children told the judge, told the evaluator, told the caseworker, told their attorney what their father had done. And as usually happens in these cases, the professionals who were there to protect them assumed that the mother was coaching them and told her, if you don't stop, you're going to lose the children altogether. And the judge ordered that the visit, normal visitation resume. Before the first visitation could occur, the father was confronted by the family babysitter in the presence of the law guardian. And he admitted that he was kissing his daughters on their privates. The law guardian immediately made a motion to stop the visitation. And I, as the attorney for the mother, also joined that motion. The judge consulted the evaluator. And the evaluator said that the father used bad judgment, but there was no reason to stop the visitation. During the first visitation, the four-year-old was penetrated for the first time. 
I decided to call Child Protective because they didn't know about the father's admission when they did the first investigation. When the judge found out, yelled and screamed at me, how dare you, they already investigated, they found nothing. But Child Protective appointed a different caseworker, did a thorough job, confirmed that what the father had done to the children was even worse than we knew. They brought charges against the father, and he never again had anything more than supervised visits. The mother received custody and had a dinner to celebrate, invited the caseworker and myself. And the children had gifts for us, but most important was what they called us. They called us believers because we believed them when all the other professionals didn't. And at that point, I learned that there is no greater honor 